When you open a game for the first time, what are your thoughts, your ideas on how this will go, your expectations, to say the least? Sometimes we don't expect much, and for good reason. The game might not just simply hold enough promise. Sometimes we can be wrong, though. A game comes out, and we all get to enjoy feeling like idiots as we play a beautifully crafted game. Sometimes, however, we hold our expectations way too high. Most of the time, this comes from sequels and spin-offs games that there should be expectations for as it needs to live up to the first. But oftentimes, we don't hold these expectations to the very first in a series, since often we just don't have enough knowledge and not enough care to hold expectations to a game we know nothing about. Why does all this matter? Well, expectations can shape the way we perceive and enjoy a game. And while sometimes being surprised by how good a game is can lead to more enjoyment out of it, having too high expectations can mess up how we enjoy games. For me, that game was Amori. Before we begin, I have a few things I want to say. Number one, this video will spoil Amori in so many ways. If you have any intent on playing this game, go play it and come back when you're done. It's not worth spoiling and the game is beautiful. If you already know the ending or you don't really care enough, that's fine, you get good to chill around. Number two, this is my first video essay, and I'm learning a new editing software to make this. Stuff might be a little weird at times, I hope not, but uh, future me better make this video good. But for now, bear with me. Number three, Kel is fucking overpowered. What do I mean by that? Wait and see. And then number four, obviously connected to the last one, I'll be giving a very quick summary of Amori before we get into the meat and bones of this video essay, so that everyone can understand where my opinions and thoughts are coming from in this video. Amori is a psychological horror RPG about our protagonist dealing with some sort of trauma. In a dream world, Amori, the player character, and his friends Aubrey, Kel, and Hiro go searching for their friend Basil after he goes missing when looking at a picture of sorts. Along with that, we have Mary, who acts as our checkpoint with picnics all over, ready to let us heal and save. Also, Mary is our sister. When not dreaming, i.e. when something weird happens in the dream world and forces us awake, we play as the protagonist, a boy called Sunny. You can choose the name for Sunny, and instead of being called Sunny, I call him Saffron. Fuck you, the wiki. His name is Saffron, and I love him. You know what? Never mind. I don't love him. I love Kel, because Kel is God. Yippee! In the dream world, at least. Now, in the dream world, you progress through the game on your search for Basil, fighting space pirates to gather information, escaping a princess castle, getting a little too distracted, fighting said princess, who's a bit of a bitch, and we learn broke up with space pirate, who we are now friends with, because he's awesome. We fought her to stop her from marrying self because she wanted to put a whole new definition of the meaning, go fuck yourself. Instead, something worse happened, she marries the space pirate, and is probably going to ruin his life. Not much we can do about that, we're like five years old. In the real world, we get to enjoy the experiences of overcoming our fears of height, drowning, and spiders. We get to hang out with Kel, trying to help Basil out and get Aubrey to stop harassing him, and preparing for Hero to come back from college. Along with that, after the night of escaping the castle, we help Poppy, Basil's caretaker, look for Basil. While on the search, we hear him screaming, and lo and behold, Basil is in our old friend group hideout near a lake, apparently being harassed by Aubrey and her new weirder friends. After confronting Aubrey and her posse, her friends all leave as we call her out for being a bitch and lore dropping that she used to be friends with us. She gets real angry and shoves Basil into the water, and Saffron, the player character, decides to jump after him. We aren't really good at saving him, although we do overcome our fear of water while we're here, but Hero, thankfully in the nick of time, is able to save both of us, and we take Basil back to his house. After that, Cal and Hero decide to stay the night at our house one last time because, oh yeah, we're moving to the big city of New York City, oh yeah, the big city, New York City. I don't know why I think they're moving to New York City, the game never really states where they're moving to, I just think it's funny. But in the dream world, we learn that our friends have all gotten jobs at a shitty hotel run by some loan shark, and after fighting the boss of his hotel and his stand, Pluto, no, I'm not kidding, we free our friends and they don't fully remember what we're looking for. The player, as we know, it's Basil, but everyone else seems to be forgetting. We learn Sweetheart, however, the shitty princess, has already broken up with the space pirate, big surprise, and is now going to witches to make a clone of herself to marry. Twice in a row, I now have to say she's putting a whole new meaning of the words, go fuck yourself. Editor's note, when I was looking over my recordings and like listening back to make sure everything sounded good, I learned that I can't say the word wishes very well, which wishes, which, I can't say that word very well. I can say witch, and I can say wish, but if I try to say them plural witch, witches, wishes, I don't know, whatever. We obviously can't let that happen, and it seems with everyone forgetting Basil's missing, we go inside of a whale, which is where the wishes live. We beat them, Sweetheart dies, 
we beat the whale who now wants to eat us, and escape into some weird waterway where a voice speaks about us and our own guilt towards something blah 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 blah. And now we're back in Basil's house, where there's a hole in his floor that allows us to go into black space, the counterpart to white space, where a lot of doors with really weird areas are. Clearing all the doors, we go to an even weirder red area where Basil's being held captive and we stab him. What? Why? Sorry, I forgot this happened. Why do we stab Basil? Who knows? Remember when I mentioned that Saffron was the protagonist and Amori was just a player character? Yeah, Amori isn't acting with us in control. It's something else entirely, and seeing as he takes the hand throne and we wake up in the night, something's off about Amori. And play Saffron too, we're both kind of fucking weird. Go talk to her in the piano room where Mary used to play the piano, we go to the mirror and see a hanging body behind us. Oh, it's gone. Okay, fine. At this point in the game, there's been a lot of hints that Mary had killed herself, and this is kind of the nail in the coffin moment, at least for me it was, when I was like, oh, okay, so she did kill herself. It might have been confirmed earlier, I'm just really stupid. Now, it's time that I reveal to you my first lie in this video. I lied when I said this was going to be a short recap. This is like half the fucking script. So buckle in, get ready, because this game gets fucking weird past this point. Waking up the next morning with Hiro making us breakfast, we get a knock on the door and learn that all of Aubrey's new posse says she won't respond to them and is stuck inside her house, and that we have to help due to the events of the prior day. Hiro, being the best boy, decides that we should help. And before we continue, by the way, I love Aubrey's posse. They're presented and written as like stereotypical bullies, but at the same time, they are a bunch of losers. And when I say that, I mean like stereotypical high school movie losers. Like one of them wants to be fucking called the Maverick. Like, these guys are stupid, and I love them. But we go to Aubrey's, basically break in, learn her house is kept like shit, which I guess is due to her fuck-ass mom, who also doesn't notice three older boys just walk into her house uninvited. But it doesn't matter, as we go to her room. So, we confront Aubrey, and, oh yeah, the main plot of the real world was that Aubrey had been bullying Basil in air quotes, right? Well, a big part of that was learning that Aubrey stole Basil's photos album, something very important to him. Aubrey explains why she took it, and when she learned that Basil had blacked out all the photos with marker, especially the ones with Mary, it angered Aubrey, since those were her memories as well. She sold a book to fix it. Uh, I no longer hate Aubrey. Throughout the whole game, I kind of hated Aubrey for like the way she was acting. Nah, I'm with her now. Still like Basil more, though. I Best boy. Hero convinces Aubrey to hang out with us for the day, since it's Saffron's last day before moving away. As I've said before, and he also convinces her to go apologize to Basil. Basil's at home right now, visiting his grandma in the hospital, so we decide to go and explore the old treehouse we built in Saffron's backyard. There, we get to see the tree stump where Mary once hung herself, and it seems due to that we haven't used the treehouse since. While everyone is relishing in memories inside the treehouse, we find a picture that says this. Uh, I'm somehow more lost now. What the fuck is going on here? What's in the toy box? Is this Five Nights at Freddy's? I don't know. We head to Basil's house after a cute group photo um, that gave us the feeling that Basil needs us the most right now. He has decided otherwise and locked himself in his room. So we play our trap card and decide to invite ourselves to stay the night. Sure, I guess. Going to bed, we dream into white space as usual, but we are Saffron and not Amori. Walking forward, we see Amori standing in his little white square, and we break his fucking light. Why? Because fuck him, that's why. And we go and fight the eye ghost that has been haunting us this whole game. We fight all of our fears again, same way we did earlier, although a new thing has shown up. Mary's body. That's hung. So we fight it, obviously, because that's the reasonable thing to do, and we learn to overcome. Doing so returns the light bulb to us, and picking it up, we walk into the light, now in some random dream forest where Basil confronts us, giving us an empty photo album, and asks us to forgive him. For fucking... for what? What is going on? Did you kill Mary? Did I kill Mary? Who killed Mary? I don't know what's going on. Five Nights at Freddy's. Now, at this point, I'm gonna start taking this script a little more seriously, and this is your last warning. Big spoilers for the plot of Amori here, and this scene is really, really good, so if you want to experience it for yourself, go play the game and then come back to this video. Entering the tree that Basil was blocking, we now enter our own living room, but now it's evil, because red lights. And we finally, finally get to learn what the fucking hell is going on through photos scattered around. Amori. In a fit of rage, after his sister had been hard on him during their music practice, threw his violin down a staircase, breaking it. Mary got angrier, and at the climax of this argument, Amori, or Saffron, sorry, pushes Mary down the stairs, accidentally killing her. I don't know how to word the rest of this, so I will be quoting the wiki, shout out to them for having all this written down. He regains control and takes Mary back to her bed and mourns her death, disassociating as well due to strong guilt and despair. Basil, who witnessed the incident, 
thought that Sunny wasn't responsible and that something behind Sunny had did it. Basil then gives the idea to stage it as a suicide to cover up her death, and Sunny, who was disconnected due to his trauma, agreed. They staged the suicide, but witness her eye opening underneath her hair as they turn back towards her hanged body, giving birth to the hallucination of something. Yeah, you remember that eyeball creature's been following us around and everything? Yeah, that's what that is. That's our that's our sister. She's dead. I said I'd take the video seriously, and I'm not. I'm very sorry. Now, before we finish up the story, can I just say, holy shit, this is such a good goddamn twist. I, in a million years, could have never guessed this, and it's so, so well done. I didn't really like the twist when I was first playing this game, and for reasons I'll explain later. Uh, but it's definitely grown on me, and... Cause, holy motherfucking waffle making dicks. It's amazing. After remembering our past, we wake up and confront Basil in his room with our newfound knowledge. Basil still believes it to be that something, and attacks us in an attempt to kill that something. During this fight, after trading blows, Basil cuts out our eye with gardening shears, and we both pass out due to exhaustion. Now, in a dream world, we enter our house, talk to Mary, who tells us to forgive ourselves, and head to the closet in our house that we were never allowed to enter before, where a toy box lies that we have the key to. Oh my god, that's what the toy box is for! I swear to god, if Freddy Fazbear jumps out of this and it's like, oh, this is what's in the toy box the whole time, I'm gonna scream. <laughs> Inside, however, is not that. It's our broken violin. And afterwards, we travel through memory lane, reliving our best memories. With each one, our violin repairs itself. Finally, we make it to a backstage, where our three friends, Kel, Aubrey, and Hira, show their support for us both in the past and now. And it's time we take the stage. After we get to play on the stage, we pass out and enter white space, where we finally confront Amori. All of our fears, our mistakes, our regrets, our grief, it ends here one way or another. Through the fight, we get reinforcements from our friends, words of encouragement. But it's not enough. Amori will not succumb. Sooner or later we will fall, and while all this is happening, Amori tries to convince us to stop. He talks on why would anyone forgive us, and that we don't deserve to forgive ourselves. Maybe he's right, and as he finally beats us, it seems that over. But we don't care what is right anymore. It's time to forgive, time to move on, and time to play our violin one last time. And with Mary playing with us, our recital that never got to happen finally gets some closure. We relive our past, in all the moments of our life with Mary and our friends that mattered the most. From sleeping with her, after having nightmares, to hanging out with our friends, to meeting Basil, to learning the piano for Mary, to stargazing, to group picnics, to Mary saving us. We put all of our memories, all of our life, into our music. And we play Mary and Saffron one last time. Amori, hearing our performance, drops his knife and the boys become one again, as we finally have the will to move forward and forgive ourselves. And, for the very last time, we exit white space to the real world. We wake up in a hospital, with bandages over our eyes, with flowers surrounding our bed from all the people we know. We get out of bed and explore the hospital where we find Basil's room, with all of our friends in it. And the game ends with the words, I have something to tell you. And if you watered Basil's plants within the dream world, you get a bonus cutscene, where Saffron and Basil take a look at each other and watch as each of their own somethings disappear. Whether our friends forgave us or not, we are free. Now, you might be wondering, Raccoon, what's the point of this? Why are you recapping Amori? I played the game 10 million years ago uh, before the human existence. Uh, I, I know this. What's the fucking point? Blah, 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 blah. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Shut up. Now, while writing this, I had hoped that my delivery and editing skills can do this whole final sequence justice, because it's just that good. But like I talked about earlier, my expectations ruined this game for me, and you might ask, how exactly? I bought this game about two years ago, didn't play it, and recently, a friend of mine, when I had been searching for a game that would make me feel emotions, had told me this is probably a good bet. When I play games, I search for emotional impact, a 
compelling story that can get me to feel violent emotions. I don't know if there's a better word to describe that, but uh, the best game I think that's done this for me would have been Xenoblade Chronicles 3. And if you've ever played it and gotten to Chapter 5, you know what feeling I'm searching for. <gasps> And if you don't know, what this game does is it takes your emotional state, shoots it with a BFG from Doom Eternal, mushes it into paste, puts it in a blender, drinks it, digests it, then spits it back out into the sun. Xenoblade 3 will destroy you, but that's not the point of this video. What I had heard is that some people say Mori gave off a similar feel, it, a deep, connecting, and emotional depressing story which had me excited. This excitement led to expectations. Along with that, I would planned to make a video essay on my experience with Amori, and I didn't really have an idea for the video. But I wanted to enjoy it so I could put passion in the video, and passion to this game. So much so that I built up too much expectations, and at a certain point, I don't think it could have ever lived up to it, no matter how good this game was. From the get-go, I was never going to love this game as much as others because I ruined it for myself. When I got to that beautifully crafted ending sequence, my only real thoughts were, yeah, okay, buddy. I went to bed that night not thinking about that ending or how the story I had grown attached to, all the characters I loved. I went to bed thinking about how am I going to write a script about this. Now, maybe there's a possibility that Amori wasn't simply the game for me. I think that's a possibility, but I think those odds are minuscule compared to what I think happened. I ruined Amori for myself. Not by spoiling it, but by expecting more than a game should be able to deliver. And it's not to Amori's fault, it's not to the game's fault, not to the developers, it is my own fault. I wanted to enjoy this so much that I ruined some of the joy I would have gotten, and I can't undo that. I can't go back in time and relive the story of this game, make up what I had lost in my hubris. It's simply just not possible. And I regret that, more than I probably should, because this game is amazing and I can tell that, I can see that it's a masterpiece, but I was too blind to see it. If I had to compare my issues with Amori, and if it didn't make sense to any of you, I think I have a game that might stand out more and give a better idea of what I'm talking about. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Cyberpunk 2077 was a game released in 2020 and it kind of flopped on launch, like big time flop. This was due to a major amount of bugs, a lack of polish, and on old gen consoles it just straight up didn't fucking work. This game, before all this, was one of the most anticipated games I honestly think ever. There were hype trailers, the game looked fun as fuck, everyone had their expectations high. Now, four years later, after tons of patches, updates, new content, and even an expansion added, the game is in its best state. The people who play it seem to really like it and talk highly of it. If the game was like this on launch, would things have been different? While I can't say for certain I'm not a prophet, nor do I have the time travel powers to see that, I think that while some people would have enjoyed it, I think the expectations for this game still would have caused it to flop in a similar manner. I don't think it could have ever succeeded the way people wanted it to. Those expectations held the game down, and even after all the bugs and issues were ironed out, it was... people didn't play it. People already had their bad taste and they didn't want to go back. The expectations killed whatever this magical game could have been, and again, the devs have covered up with it and made it so much better, props to them for fixing it. There's so many people who are still salty that it didn't live up to it in the moment. Is it their fault for feeling those expectations? Yes and no. Because while the game was hyped up with amazing cinematics and cool insider info, that's the normal launch cycle of studio games. It's the norm, so it's not truly the dev's fault, but it could kind of be chalked up to that. It could also be the expectations of the fans, people expecting this to be the new GTA and take over. When, at the end of the day, it's just gonna be a game you play, it won't change your life. I did that to myself. I ruined the experience of Mori to myself. With my own expectations, and my own wishes for the game to be more than it could have been. So what? So what? Why does all this matter? Why am I talking about this? Well, for one, this video is a warning to others. Don't do what I did. When a game seems interesting and it has promise, let it sit at that and just play it. Don't build expectations, don't wait and let it build up in your mind what a masterpiece this game could be. Just enjoy it and let the masterpiece come to you. Video games are art and to expect art to be perfect is unachievable. Art is imperfect, no matter what, and that's what makes it beautiful, that's what makes it human. The other reason this video exists is a message to my future self. I never want to do this again, I never want to play a game and ruin it for myself. I just want to play games and enjoy them. I want to play games, I want to read books and watch movies and enjoy art with no expectations, no wishes, only my own curiosity, 
and the joy that these things bring me. Now, I'm no genius, but I like to think that this message of expectations and holding things in a high pedestal when we shouldn't could be applied to real life. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not very smart either. I'm pretty fucking stupid. So I don't really know how that could apply to real life. But at the end of the day, treat everything like this, I feel like. Don't hold things to such a high expectation and ruin things for yourselves. Instead, just let yourself be surprised. Let yourself have a good time with things. Whether it's something you're consuming and enjoying or even something you make. I think at the end of the day, just enjoy it. Hi, this is Future Raccoon here. Just want to say that after about two weeks having finished this game and having to edit all these different sequences, I'm starting to definitely grow a bigger connection to this game. And I'm starting to actually enjoy it more and understand the characters and really like the story more than I did when I finished it. I don't think I'll ever be able to get the same feeling that other people get out of this game, but I'm glad I'm starting to enjoy it a little bit more and maybe make up for the mistake I made with this. If you're at this point in the video, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. This video was a ton of fun to make, and I definitely plan to make more like it. So if you enjoyed, a subscription would be awesome. If you don't really care to subscribe, that's fine too. Go have a lovely day, and thanks for checking this video out. I also just wanted to say, if you're interested, I am streaming on Twitch. I'm not consistent. It's kind of when I have free time and my roommate isn't in my room. Uh, but whenever I'm able to, I do want to be live, and I try to do at least twice a week. I play games or am practicing for my esports team. If you want to stop by and chat, I'd really enjoy that. I'm very, very willing to. Alright, see everyone around soon. Oh yeah, didn't I say I was going to talk about how Kel is God? Oh, oh, look at this setup. Oh, look at the damage. Oh, 5,000! Wow!